five years? Oh, 25, 30, something like that, yeah. Uh, goes out on weekends with a tape recorder and uh, a camera. And he's been kind enough to take me on several. And he just has a deep interest and love for this region. He's grown up here, born and raised in Springfield. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, was a printer by trade, but in his spare time, he's devoted a lot of work. He has these made thousands of recordings and so forth. It's, he's gotten the attention of people all over the country. Uh, the NEA, National Arts of the often calls him up to serve on panels. The state arts councils here to do the same. And uh, he's been responsible for making some very or responsible for serving on some committees that have made some very high level decisions about arts in this country. Uh, he has the pleasure of working with Van Randolph for six years on volume two of the Ozark Bibliography. And uh, he'd like to talk about Van as a person and his work with him. So, Gordon uh, McCain. Okay. Well, I am not a folklorist. I'm a collector, period. Now, that's all I am. That's one thing. Uh, also, uh, I've always felt the reason the NEA and all of them have me is because they need a token redneck on the committees up there. <laughs> and I serve that purpose being from that hinterland, you know. Well, I, I live close to Branson, too. That always makes me happy. Well, when I first agreed to do this talk, that, it would have been pretty easy because I've given one before on my relationship with Vance when we worked on the... Uh, bibliography for about almost six years. But then I got to realizing it would be, be like uh, getting you all in on the last of a movie because I'm sure you represent most of the population around here in that you had, weren't raised here. You aren't from here, a lot of you. You've lived here maybe, well, I think the Chamber of Commerce did their survey here last year and 30% of the people in Southwest Missouri, and I'm sure this holds true for Northwest Arkansas, have lived here uh, five years or less. That's almost one in three people. So I'm going to, I had to really buckle down then because I didn't know all this either, you know, out of the, to give a talk on it. I had to really get, uh, get to work on some books I had to find out a lot of things about Vance that I'd forgotten about. Uh, the people I'll be using for a lot of this, plus my, my own rec, uh, recollections, will be uh, uh, Dr. Bob Cochran at the University of Arkansas. He did uh, Randolph's bibliography and uh, Dr. Herbert Halpert, who's a professor emeritus now at St. John's University in Newfoundland, a folklorist who was a close friend of Ansys, and Dr. Bill McNeil at the uh, Folk Center in Mountain View, Arkansas. Uh, he's the Arkansas folklorist, in fact. So anyway, this is all keyed up now. I'm, everything's going to run just like clockwork. When oh, I wow. get to this, number one's going to go on here. If it doesn't, I'm going to say it's not my fault that the devil's here, and that's the whole problem we have. So you're in. Vance Randolph 101 is where you are right now, so we'll just start right at the first. Well, Vance was born February 23, 1892, in Pittsburgh, Kansas. His father, John Randolph, was born in Pennsylvania, uh, but lived in North Carolina and uh, came to uh, Kansas in the 1870s. Uh, he was a, a, a lawyer and a teacher for a while and dabbled in politics in, in Pittsburgh. But he died at age 44 when Vance was only nine years old. And then his mother was Teresa Gould Randolph. She was born in Illinois and came to uh, Kansas as a child. And her father was from Maine originally. They were Puritans. But the Randolph family from then on were Episcopalians. And Vance, even to the last, maintained he was an Episcopalian. His first trip to the Ozarks, the first one of many, was in 1898 when they went down to uh, uh, Pineville uh, over in McDonald County. And that's over in the southeast corner of the state on the Elk River and a bunch of pretty rivers over in there. And he met over there a, a river guide named Price Payne, uh, who and went subsequent years too. They took this vacation more than once. That, that really influenced his life. This man was also a storyteller and knew a lot of songs and everything. Even when he was a child, he was influenced. Well, his early years, he attended Pittsburgh public schools, and he dropped out of high school. He was bored with it, I they say. Uh, worked at odd jobs for a while, and then 1911, he, uh, he enrolled in uh, uh, Pittsburgh College, which is still a college that's there. Only I think it's southeast Kansas now. I'm not sure what it is. We're just Pittsburgh College. He graduated there in 1914 with a BA in biology and a BS in education. Now, let's see. Let's get started with the sequence here. See what happens. This is Vance when he was a college student. How's that? 
Yeah, I guess you can see that, can't you? Uh, and after he graduated in 1911, he went to Clark University, I think that's in Worcester, Massachusetts. Studied under G. Stanley Hall, who was a noted psychologist then, uh, the father of modern psychology, and uh, got, him, got his master's in 1915 in psychology, and he went right on to Columbia University in New York while he was in the East, and uh, to work on his PhD under the father of anthrop modern anthropology, or anthropology at that time, Franz Boas. And uh, so, as they were working, Boas, were not, they were not interested in uh, uh, the Ozarks at all. And he wanted Randolph to go up in British Columbia and do his work with some Indians up there, some Indian tribes. Randolph, Randolph said, no, I want to do it in the Ozarks. Well, there was an impasse. So that ended the PhD in anthropology. Then, while I was there, he went to Greenwich Village. As you're going to see, that kind of fits, that environment kind of fits him, because Vance was a free soul, to say the least, on a lot of things. He worked as an editor and a ghostwriter for a while, and print, his first printed work was a poem called The Masses. He returned to Pittsburgh and sold insurance for a little while until he ran out of relatives and friends <laughs> and got hungry, so he started teaching in the high school, teaching biology. But his lifestyle was not uh, in line with the social uh, graces in Pittsburgh, and some leaders in the town asked for an investigation of him by the school board. Well, he heard it, and so he just quit. And he went to work then for three months at the Appeal to Reason. That's a socialist newspaper. And you have to remember, Pittsburgh, Kansas, was not like the rest of the Ozarks. Pittsburgh and Frontenac and Minden Mines were all in the strip mine area. And they were called the Little Balkans because they had a lot of uh, Middle European people that settled there to work in the mines. And there were like something like six and seven, maybe eight languages spoken in that uh, part of the country. And a lot of different political ideas and social ideas were always fomenting there. In fact, his dad, when he dabbled in politics a little bit, would always make a point to uh, have some phrases in each of the languages to throw in his speeches to get in with the people. Well, uh, in 1917, that same, later on that same year, he moved to the Ozarks. But he wasn't there very long until he got drafted into the Army. And he was only stationed in Kansas and then Arkansas. And then uh, in November of that same year, he got out on a medical discharge. I don't know how he worked that, but he probably did. But he still would always talk about how proud he was of his service in the Army, uh, the fact that the Huns never set foot on Kansas or Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> so after he got out of his discharge, he just drifted around the country, kind of an educated tramp. And then he was tired of starving again, decided he'd go on with a, uh, another career. So he enrolled in the University of Kansas to get a PhD in psychology. He was there two years. Well, while he was there, Carl Sandburg uh, was there doing some work, and another folk song, renowned folk song collector named Mildred Larkin was there. Well, Vance got involved with them and it, it uh, escalated his interest in folk songs and all that type of thing. He'd been doing a little bit of collecting before he uh, enrolled there. And uh, after two years, he gave up his work on the PhD and returned to uh, Pineville to work on the, the folk lore uh, aspects. Now, scholars consider Sandberg's work, uh, I have a copy of, what do they call it? The song bag, I think it is, American song bag. And they consider it academically worthless because it's not annotated or anything. But Bill McNeil, Dr. McNeil, uh, in Mountain View, says the positive part of Sandberg is that his, his collection influenced Randolph to return to his own collecting. So that was good. I guess you'll wait. I've got another slide here. Let's see. Do I or don't I? Nope, not yet. That was, I'll take that off anyway. We're getting tired of seeing it, probably. Uh, he returned to Pineville and uh, began collecting all aspects of life and uh, began really to collect folk life instead of folklore. Because folklore is more, uh, at least in my mind, it's more the study of myths and legends and, and fairy tales and that type. And he was kind of like a general practitioner. His approach to it was the skin and its contents. And that's what he began to collect, all aspects of Ozark's life. But he supported himself as he would for most of his life as a professional writer. That's the only thing that kept him from starving. By 1927, he did his first writings for some scholarly journals. He did it for the dialect notes with word lists and the Journal of American Folklore and Folk Beliefs. And in Pineville, the Pineville Democrat, he started a column called Songs Grandpa Sang. Now, Lucille Morris Upton, any of you know who Lucille Morris Upton was? All right. She had the same column in the Springfield paper in 1934 and 35 that ran, I think, uh, once a month or something, where she collected folk songs from people out in the hills. Well, by the end of 1930, 
he had published enough that he was beginning to be recognized by the uh, uh, academic community. And at that time also, he married a woman named Marie Wilbur. She was the daughter of a Pineville doctor who was also one of the top water witches in the area. You know what a water witch is, all of you? Dowser. And uh, she was a divorcee. She was older than Vance. And uh, I used to hear people that are gone now that knew Vance uh, much longer than I did say that they always suspicioned he married her for her contacts and the fact that she supplied a lot of stories and things for his work. I don't know. I wouldn't put it past him. Now, oh, I know. Here, when he, when he went back to the Ozarks, I'll put that. See? There. Yeah, that's him in the hills. I'm going to see it. I guess that's, is there a focus? I don't guess there is. Well, anyway, you can tell it is. Uh, in 1931, he uh, took a uh, covered wagon trip that he says he went from Pineville to Little Rock. Well, Cochran, who did his bibliography, checked all that out, and in the time allotted to this thing, he couldn't have possibly done that. It was too many miles. So he said, I think, yeah, I think people can see that better. Uh -huh. I can still see this. That's fine. Uh, he probably went in a circular route around Eureka Springs and Fayetteville, all that area of northwest Arkansas is probably what they did. <coughs> now, in 1931 came the first book, uh, The Ozarks, The American Survival of a Primitive Society. I'll just put these out as we talk about them here. And uh, let's see if this is one. Yeah, that's the old boy I bought the house from in uh, Pineville. That's Ed Wall, as he's made. I thought that was a colorful little character. But so that was his first book. And uh, the public reviews were good, but the academic world completely ignored it. And the next year, in 1932, came a second book, Ozark Mountain Folks, which is really a continuation of this in the same format. Now, what was different about his format was he had, like I said, this holistic approach to the people, the skin and his contents, which was not uh, the thing that the anthropologists and folklorists did in those days. Uh, he discussed the history of the area and the uh, settlements and uh, their houses, their activities, their recreations, of course, their music, games, and storytelling, uh, their foodways, preservation, preparation, all their crafts and everything. So he just gave a whole picture. And like I said, up to then, uh, folklore was just the study of compilation of texts. In other words, it was based on a historical premise. In other words, they'd go out and uh, very few folklorists had any uh, personal contact, really, with their informants. They never got involved with the culture that they were studying. Uh, some of them were even desk folklorists. They would have other people go out and collect the data, bring it in, and they would write about it. But they weren't interested in the people themselves. They were interested in the stories that they told and the legends that they have, and then they would trace these back in history. That was the main object of doing all this. Uh, so let's see here. Yeah, well, I can where I am here. So these two books show how different Vance's, Vance's approach was, because now being self-educated in these matters, uh, he wasn't indoctrinated with any academic disciplines at the time. Uh, he was studying folklore in his social context. He was a free soul, or, uh, probably a loose gun, according to those guys. <laughs> I mean, they didn't like anybody coming in with new ideas like that. But he was, uh, also there was some other, Margaret Mead about this time, she did the same thing in the South Seas really got involved with the people, became one of them, you know, same type thing. But he was the perfect participant, observer, and collector. Now, in 1933 came his third book from an Ozark holler, uh, a collection of 22 short stories, fiction. Uh, New York Times then, by then, was saying that Randolph was the recognized authority on the Ozark language customs. All the reviews of it were positive. Uh, these are mostly first-person narratives uh, of Vance himself, really, because the reason he did that is that in those days, publishers wouldn't cook, wouldn't print folklore, uh, I mean, uh, storytelling like that, folk tales. Uh, I tell you, uh, just to show you, I'll do this just to uh, see what kind of a character he was, though. This is dedicated to the three merry widows, Agnes, Mary, and Becky, which was the three brands of condoms at that time. <laughs> I'm sure the publishers didn't know that. In 1934 came the cat, uh, another fiction book, The Camp on Wildcat Creek. Uh, all of these, of course, are Ozark settings with his information interspersed all through it. You know, they're all based on Ozark uh, folklife. 
uh, the fictional story for boys about the boys come from the city and uh, come under the tutelage of a native, and he teaches them uh, all the ways of the wilds, you know, and all the all this, the uh, uh, superstitions and all that type of thing. Now, uh, Cochran in his biography said this is one clean book. Like in other words, I think he's making the point that this was a clean book. This wasn't even controversial about this, like some of his others. But Mary Parlow, who later became his wife many years later, called it the worst book for boys ever written. Well, it really wasn't that bad. It's not that good either. Then in 1934, he did Ozark Outdoors. That's the only book I don't have. Uh, he did it with another man from Pittsburgh. Uh, they did 24 hunting and fishing stories. Ten of these were by Randolph. And most have been uh, printed in other magazines and journals before. Now another. This could be a talk. This next subject could be a talk all its own. In 1934, a woman named Sarah Gertrude Knott, who was a wealthy St. Louis philanthropist, uh, was entered in, interested in the arts. Well, she went to Asheville, North Carolina to the Mountain Dance and Folk Festival. These folk, folk festivals from the turn of the century on were beginning to become popular around the country, only they were more pageants than they were festivals then. And she came back all enthused, and she sold the St. Louis Chamber of Commerce on the idea that they were going to have a national folk festival in St. Louis. So they formed a committee, and there were to be preliminary festivals in 14 states in the Midwest. Well, the festivals, they were really tryouts for this, for each state. And they were to start in the Ozarks at Eureka Springs. Well, they picked May Kennedy McCord, who, of course, was called the Queen of the Hillbillies then, to be the uh, regional uh, leader of it. And uh, Vance had already worked with her before. He knew her, and they'd gone around with her. She helped him collect, and then she contributed uh, more than 70 songs to Ozark folk songs later on. Well, May, uh, May Kennedy McCord and Sarah Gertrude Knott went down to Galena to get Randolph involved. Well, they got him enthused, and he agreed to help. He said he was really interested in festivals, but all the people I know say he was also interested in Sarah Gertrude Knott, who was a pretty good-looking gal. Uh, well, wait, I'm forgetting all my slides here. I told you, be gone, devil. That's what I told you then. Now, okay, we'll better take this one off, hadn't it? Now, let's see, you can read who these people are here, but uh, that Emma Galbraith there is Art Galbraith's aunt. That was my partner for 17 years from Green County over here. And then Miss Parker, I don't know, and then there's Vance Randolph, the third there, and uh, Miss Harvey Webb, then May Kennedy McCord's got her profile to you. And then the man, short man standing there is, is uh, Vascom Lamar Lusford. He's the one that put on the, the festival in Asheville. And, the woman on the end is Sarah Gertrude Knott, and she had asked him to come and help them uh, put together their festival, so he came to Springfield for that. And I saw her in 1979 when Art and I were, uh, we uh, performed at the National Folk Festival at Wolf Trap, and she was there. And she was in her 80s then, but she was still a really a striking woman. I can see where they probably were interested. Because the story was that Vance was interested in her, and that uh, Bernard, or, Lamar Baskin, what is it? I get this all confused here. Baskin Lamar Lusford also was interested in it. Now here's, here he is again there. And I always heard that uh, he won out over Vance, so I don't know that, what, what he means by one out. Now that, the man with him there is David Rice. Now David just died in January this year. I think David was, to my knowledge, and that doesn't mean this is true, but uh, it was one of the last people that, uh, perf that uh, recorded for Randolph and uh, uh, Sidney Robertson Crowell for the WPA for the Library of Congress in 1934 in his house over here on uh, West McDaniel. And I recorded him too in the same room where they did. Only I was considerable 10 years ago, you know. But he was the last one that I know that really was your, one of your, your old ballad singers in this region. This has been set up wrong. I was going to have you do this, Drew. Help your grade. <laughs> well, let's see. Anyway, the the, uh, the the head of after they selected who was to perform from this region, they had a uh, I don't know if it was the final tryout or just a showcase at the Electric Theater. Now, the Electric Theater later became the Fox Theater, which is a church I think now in the northeast corner of the square. And after that, they had a big banquet at the Kentwood Arms, and all the performers and the, the staff that worked on it were there. And one of the speakers was John T. Woodard. Woodard's building was one of his uh, projects here. Uh, he got up to give a talk, and he shocked them all because he began to admonish them. 
uh, telling them that uh, I've got some blow-ups of these later. I'll put them out if you want to see them later before you can read them. That uh, the freak show will not get the Chamber of Commerce's support. He was talking about how, you know, we don't want them to think, well, uh, Lucille Moore Sutton was there that night. She said one thing she remembered was that he, they say here that we don't want to have the trouble like those folks in Arkansas, but he also said we don't want people to think of us like those folks in Arkansas. And there were a bunch of Arkansas people sitting out there, see, they've been selected to perform this too. <laughs> So the next day, and that night too, uh, a lot of the other people really came down on him. So the next day, he kind of turned around too, said, oh, he didn't mean anything by it. He just didn't want to. And uh, of course, he, he singled out Vance for one, saying that we have some people that aren't from here that are cavorting with the lower echelon of people, you know, instead of showing the good people. And this went on for, a, Few days here. I've got. Uh, since I did these, I'll put them up here. Now this is the one that really got into it here. See, he says Harold Bell right hardly knew a thing about him, and Vance Randolph sitting across the table listening to him doesn't know much about the Ozarks. He's been consorting with some of that undercrust. <clears throat> now this Woods Colt was by a fellow named Thames Williamson, who was a writer, but Vance was the ghost writer on most of that book. And uh, of course, a rig Woods Colt, I don't know, is an illegitimate child. Uh, and of course, he says down here that uh, the rottenest, nastiest stuff I've ever seen in print. My Lord, what would he think nowadays if he were still here? I don't think he. I knew him a bit vaguely, though. And uh, anyway, but that's what went on with all this. The, of course, as it is, here's the way it ended up. The last on Randolph's face. Always for the festival, the leader says. You know. You know, what's interesting to me, now, this, I'm not being sarcastic or anything, but, you know, I've lived here all my life, and I've listened to this hillbilly image stuff for years and years and all that, this mainstreaming, you know, they want to be just like them folks in New York and everything. But it's interesting to me that now, I don't know if they still do, but in recent years, our Chamber of Commerce now gives an honorary hillbilly award, <laughs> which I thought was kind of a turnaround from those days. There we go, Page is going there. You just watch my time and when it up, just say that's it. All right, now, in 1935 came another fiction book. I've got these wrong here, though. Let me see here. That'll be gone. Yeah, I'll do. Here it is. Hedwig was the name of it. It's a story about a German American girl, a Russian born, who comes to live in the Ozarks. That, that, by Ozarks, she lived in Oklahoma, southeast Kansas, and, and Missouri, too. Missouri too. Kind of broad area there. But uh, I always like what the uh, dust jacket says on the thing. It says migration, young love, hardships, marriage, brutality, childbirth, divorce, illicit loves, poverty, prostitution. One after another, she experiences each and emerges philosophic and undented. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's pretty good. You know? <laughs> but uh, that was one he wrote, man, that was a uh, it did good on the reviews, but nobody bought it. And uh, what was funny about it is his friend, uh, Mr. What was his name? Fred Church, I can't remember, uh, bought stock and uh, paid money back to, you know, to have it done, lost, lost everything he put in it. You know. Now, then another one of these, goes up here. Another thing that could be a whole program was the Missouri Writers Project. Uh, during the Depression, the WPA, FDR's administration, started the the Federal Writers Project it was under the WPA. And each state was to get together uh, writers and, and artists and everything, and they were to, each state was to produce a book that told uh, all the aspects of the state, commerce and uh, the arts and the literature and the folk uh, life and all this type of thing. Well, with all, almost all of them, it became a political mess because that's what got involved with it was politics. But anyway, here, uh, there was a woman named Geraldine Parker who had worked with Vance on the Folk Festival. And uh, she had connections with, with Pendergast in Kansas City. So she was given the post of supervisor of the Missouri Writers Project. Well, she got Vance a, an assistant supervisor job. And he was to go out and collect all this Ozarks material and get that all uh, uh, gathered up and uh, ready for publication. And uh, they had problems right off because uh, the WPA in uh, Washington and the uh, Missouri Writers Project here uh, got 
off on each other. And it ended up that Parker got fired, and the woman that took her place fired Randolph. And uh, oh, I've got just too many pages here. Anyway, I don't need these really. But, but there was supposed to be a section called the Ozark Guide, and uh, about and that was to be about the Ozarks. But uh, at that time, same time, the Chamber of Commerce withdrew its support. Its financial backing was like five thousand dollars or something for this book. And uh, they said because it played up delinquencies of Ozarkians to an extreme degree, saying nothing of their good traits. And Cochrane's book puts in parentheses Shades of John T. Woodruff, which is about the same. But the whole thing was, in most of the states, was a political mess. Uh, it was finally published for Missouri, and you have these in the line. They've been republished again. I know you have Kansas and Oklahoma and all those, uh, by Charles Van Ravensway in 1941. And there's well, there a small section on music and there's a little bit in there about fiddling and, and singing, some folk music. But uh, Randolph, uh, they just mentioned his name and that he had written so many books, and that's it, about three lines. That's all he got. Now, he had thought he was going to get all that information to use himself later on with his stuff. Well, it disappeared. Tennessee never did find theirs. They never published a book, I don't think, and they never found all that material had been gathered. And in a lot of states, it just disappeared, whether they got thrown away or what, they don't know. You know? So it's just... Though they may have published one, they didn't use that type of that, that type of collection, you know. Well, then in the 30s, what are we supposed to be here? I guess I have one here. Let's see if I'm supposed to show another slide yet. No, 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 no. Yeah, I was. No, I'm not. Anyway, in the 30s, of course, it was the Depression, and as I said, the only way he uh, supported himself was being a professional writer. Well, he even started selling insurance again, and that didn't work. Well, there was a man named Haldeman, Emmanuel Haldeman Julius, who started a publishing company in Girard, Kansas. He married a woman whose father was the president of the bank there and was very wealthy, and uh, started publishing these little little blue books, they called them, and uh, big blue books later. But these these used to be at all the bus stations and the train stations, and uh, oh, that's the size they were. They cost probably a dime a piece or something like that. Well, Vance started writing for him in 1924 on these, and uh, the range of topics is unbelievable that uh, Haldeman Julius published, and of course Vance wrote on an amazing number of them himself. Uh, he wrote many under his name, and then also under 12 different pseudonyms. But I hear just there's wild stories from the Ozarks, funny stories from the Ozarks, tall tales from the Ozarks, French dictionary, uh, German self-taught. These are all by Randolph. Uh, pocket English German Dictionary, Zoology Self-Taught, Interesting Facts About How Spiders Live, <laughs> Life Among the Ants, Life Among the Butterflies, Life Among the Dragonflies, <laughs> How to Know Songbirds, and here's the ironic one that gets me, Beekeeping for Profit. And of course, he'd gone broke when he had that, those, bought those 97 beehives back in uh, uh, Ironville. But then they also, uh, they came in later with uh, what they called uh, big blue books too. And here's a lot of his pseudonyms. I'll just go through these real quick. Well, here's one that was by Anton S. Booker, Freud on sleep and sexual dreams. Uh, Carrie Nation of Kansas by Anton Booker. Uh, here's the amazing book of amazing confessions. Uh, let's see here. And there's four different ones by him, all by uh, uh, pseudonyms. I am a scarlet woman. That was anonymous. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I got my lover lynched. That was by uh, Louis Brent, Louise Brent. Are today's girl competing with the red light district? That was by Elizabeth Hamilton. Confessions of a rapist by Richard Gould. That's his mother's maiden name he used there. Secrets of Secret Lore of Witchcraft by Gerald Harley. Adventures of uh, Davy Crockett by Arthur S. Tolliver. The Truth About Drugs and Narcotics. Don't be a dope fiend, it says. That was by William Yancey Shackford. Here's Bell Starr about Shackford. But he, <coughs> this is just a few of them. There's a bunch more of these I have. <coughs> but uh, he also, when, when Haldeman Julius sales began to drop under those big blue, uh, big blue books, he started, got into soft chronology a little bit. And then with most of those, he didn't publish his name. He just put published in Gerard, Kansas. <coughs> but Mance helped out on a bunch of those. Uh, Confessions of a Gold Digger, How to Get a Husband, The Modern Sex Book, Autobiography of a Madam, How to Keep Your Virginity, 
only one was his, Autobiography of a Pimp. And that was surpassed by the post office after it uh, uh, was out for a while. But Cochran had a fact in here that I thought was interesting. By 1951, Haldeman Julius Publishing Company had published over 500 million booklets with 6,000 titles. You talk about turning them out, I guess that was. Now, in 35, he was having serious troubles with his wife. And uh, it, I think in a year later or so, she uh, was ready to divorce him when she died of cancer. She was buried at Pineville. Now, he didn't even attend her funeral, so I don't guess there was any love between them. Let me see here. I'll do another. Oh, well, I will catch up on these in a minute. Uh, in 1936, then, he wrote The Camp Meeting Murders, another fiction book. Now, he wrote this with a woman whose pseudonym was Nancy Clemens. Now, she started out writing as Nancy Nance, but her publisher told her it sounds too much like Fancy Pants, so change her name. You know, I think this was her grandmother's maiden name. Now, Nancy Clemens is really uh, Fern Nance. Nance's greenhouse, it used to be over on North Grant, that's her family. And she's Fern Shoemaker now, she still lives over there. Uh, she wrote this entire book, and then she gave him the man, she'd worked with Vance on some other things before then, and she gave him the manuscript to go ahead and, and get a published for her. When he did that, he just stuck his name on it too. And she says he didn't write a, a thing on here, but she probably uh, helped him get it published, but helped her get it published. But this was about a small town in the Ozarks, and it's really Galena, Missouri is what they based it on. And uh, it's all thinly disguised because some of the characters in here, if you knew the background of Galena, you'd recognize some of these characters in here. By 1937, though, he uh, really had an alcohol problem. Uh, it was beginning to really affect his health. Uh, his father had also had the same problem. And uh, he and this friend, Church, who uh, boy, I read and everything, always had an alcohol problem, uh, went to the Keeley Institute of Illinois for the cure. Uh, and so in 1943, he wrote Confessions of a Booze Fighter. I took the Keeley Cure, so he wrote about his own experience on that. He just wrote about everything. And his mother died in 1938. He'd been very close to her, and that was, they say, quite a blow to him. Now, in 1940, he did Ozark's Anthology, which is a, a series of articles by 15 authors, 15 different authors. All of these have been printed before uh, that were friends of his. And he uh, edited it and uh, did the introduction to it. The only way, Cax is it Caxton or Claxton Press up in Caldwell, Idaho? I think it's Caxton, C-A-X, isn't it? Yeah, okay. They wouldn't publish it unless he agreed to buy the first 100 copies. So that's the only way he got that one published. Now, 1940, he moved in with the Short family in Galena. Now, the Short family was one of these, what we used to have all over the Ozarks. Uh, in one community, they'd have an extended family, like the Blues in Christian County just all over the place, you know. But they, some of them wielded a lot of uh, influence in the community, and it was kind of a deal where you were either with them or you were against them, you know. And all the little towns had those type of things. Well, the Short family uh, had attained a little bit more than most of them did. Uh, of course, Dewey already knew it because he used to go and stay at Galena, and he'd stay at Aunt Fanny Mathis' boarding house, which was just off the square. Uh, the, the, but the Short family consisted of Dewey Short, who was our congressman for 24 years, Theodore and Blaine Short both became successful businessmen. Charlie Short was a career military officer. I think he I made general. Then there was Helen, Bess, and Fanny, who uh, all lived good lives. But then the, the one that was liked more by all the people, and they used to say he was, he was the best of the lot, was Leonard Short. And Leonard Short was a bootlegger and a bank robber. And uh, <coughs> he was killed escaping prison in Oklahoma in 1935. Well, his wife, I've seen pictures of her. And she was really a beautiful woman, Lillian Scott Short. Uh, you all are familiar with Mary Scott Hare, who does the Samantha column in the train paper? This is her cousin. And uh, Vance wanted her to marry him, begged her to marry him, and uh, she wouldn't do it. And I've also heard from many <coughs> that Dewey was also interested in Lillian. And I know there was some hard feeling for years between these two, and I imagine it stemmed from that. She ended up marrying somebody else uh, and didn't. Wasn't much better than Leonard, from what I've heard. Uh, now, Randolph, while he was there, wrote a history of the Short family. And Lillian, though, talked him into destroying it, because she said there was too much about Leonard, and there's other things about the Shorts that shouldn't be put in print. And I really was, he's always, always said, told me he regretted that he, he destroyed, well, thank you, he destroyed that, uh, that manuscript. I know J. Frank Short, uh, 
That's the reason I know the shorts is J. Frank's daughter, Suzanne Edel, is my wife's best friend. So that's how we got involved with the shorts for years and years and years. But J. Frank told me one of his best memories of uh, Randolph when he lived at the short home was that typewriter going all hours of the day and night. Well, I, just, I forgot to put these up here. There's what he looked like when he lived in Galena with his fedora. And this, there's a good picture that exemplifies what I was saying Jay Frank was talking about. Okay, now another episode in his life that's of interest to me and any of us that are familiar with the Ozarks. Rose O'Neill came to the Ozarks uh, with her family uh, in the last of the 1800s. And of course, she was a really a beautiful woman, gained a lot of fame as an expert illustrator, and married well, became very wealthy. Uh, she and her sister Calista, Calista had uh, country homes in Connecticut, and one in New York, and one uh, on the Isle of Capri in Europe. Uh, but they still had a place, uh, it may have been the family place at one time, uh, at Bonnybrook, which is, of course, on Bear Creek, what used to be Day, Missouri, was near there, it used to be a post office, just north of Branson. Well, of course, she created the Coopy Dolls in 1913. Oh, wait, I've got some slides here. The talk's fine. It's me getting this stuff all together. It's causing the time here. Oh, I can. No, that's all right. I, I think it's. Uh, I, I think that probably. Is. Now, there, there they are around 1915. And uh, she. Uh, in fact, the, the song Rose of Washington Square, which is an old turn of the century song, was, was dedicated to her. That's what it was written about. Well, she was a lot like Randolph. She was a kind of a free soul herself. And in the late 30s, she retired to Bonnybrook with her sister Calista and her brother Clarence. They called him Clink. And Rant Vance already knew her because he used one of her short stories in that, anth that Ozarks anthology, The Hired Man. Well, she was beginning, starting to write her autobiography, so she got hold of Vance and asked him to come help her, come over to Bonnybrook. Well, she had him all but move in, and they became good friends. Let's see here. There they are. And uh, uh, Vance completed the, what he thought was a good book, but the sister got, Callista got hold of it and blue penciled everything out of it that she thought shouldn't be made public. Well, he rewrote it again, watered it down. Well, then she watered it down further. And so finally he said uh, it was watered down to nothing, and he just threw his hands up and called it quits. Now, I think there's a copy at College of the Ozarks, and there used to be one at the Shepherd of the Hills Museum. If it didn't burn up, they had a fire a few years ago up in their office, and that's where the safe was that had all their Rose O'Neill stuff they had up there, and Harold Bell Wright and all that type of stuff. Uh, but these, I've been told, are the uh, watered-down versions that Callista had done. Let's see here, by the way. Now that's the whole clan. There's Rose and Clank and Vance and Callista on the side. That's in her house there. Uh, I talked to people that used to go there and said uh, it was out of a museum just about, but nothing really matched. It was all just kind of empire and Roman or whatever you call them all, you know, and everything. And she and uh, Callista always wore these kind of smocks, these uh, ankle length smocks. I don't know if they had a word, I forgot what they called them. But anyway, um, about that time that he was there, she was making uh, Ho Ho the Laughing Buddha. She was gonna, another Cupid all type thing. She wanted to start promoting it. And in fact, Rose gave me one autograph. Now, whatever happened to it, my Lord, if I had it now, I could make some money on that. You know, I would, I wouldn't sell it. But the reason I knew Rose O'Neill is we had a photostat machine, our company, Springfield Blueprint Company. And in those days, the only way you could copy anything was either by photostat or by camera. Well, a photostat is nothing more than a camera with a paper negative and a paper positive, you know, print. So she and Callista, I remember them vividly coming in a lot. and. Uh, she gave me that, and uh, I told Vance this when uh, that I knew her when we were talking one time. Also, her brother, her son, her nephew, excuse me, her nephew Dick O'Neill had a radio repair shop next door to our business down on Robertson Street. 
And I told I said, I knew Rose Vance, but I said, when I knew her, she was an old woman. He said, hell, she was old when I knew her, too. Because people have tried to say there was something between the two more than just friendship, and there's never been anything uh, found established that uh, that was the fact. You know, I remember I told him, too, that I always remembered uh, those beautiful, dark brown eyes of hers. I said, I'll always remember them. He said, well, that's fine, except her eyes were blue. <laughs> so there's a sketch she did of him. Yes. Well, I'll tell you another story. I'll just slip in some little local stuff in here, and if I get over, we'll just cut it off here anyway. Uh, Madge Evans uh, told my wife that uh, back in the, th about this time, early 40s, uh, they were starting the Sprinkle Arts Council. So they had a benefit dinner to raise money. And they asked Rose to come be the guest speaker. Well, they got uh, Dillon Brothers Packard Agency, which used to be on the corner of Pershing and Robertson, to give them a new Packard to go down and pick Rose up at Bonnybrook. And they, when Rose got back, they told her, said anything uh, you, uh, any expenses you have while you're here, you can charge them to the Arts Council. Well, she brought Callista and Clink with her. And while they were in town, she bought Clink some shoes and bought herself and Callista clothes, charged them to them. And uh, it ended up that Rose cost them more than the benefit made. And the <laughs> Dillon brothers had a fit because this was a brand new Packard and Bobby Brook then was nothing but a horse trail from Day, Missouri. And you can imagine driving the brand new Packer back up through those trails. It was all scratched up and mud all over it and all that way. Now, the biggie came in in 1946, which is, how am I doing on this? I'm getting pretty long, aren't I? When did we start? When did we start? 7.15? I'll move along here. Uh, it was Ozark Folk Songs. Of course, he'd been collecting these since 1919, 1920, and he... Uh, had that column, Songs Grandpa Sang, that were in, that, in the Pineville Democrat and also in Ozark Life magazine. But in 1931, he sent the transcript to Harvard. They weren't interested. And then the songs numbered about 300. And uh, in 1941, the Archive of American Song was, was uh, organized at, under, at the Library of Congress under the, uh, uh, what is that? Well, anyway, Folk Life Division or Folk Division. And they already had 876 songs and fiddle tunes on 198 discs. Now, I'm sure part of that was what Vance had done during WPA days. And, of course, the other part was probably by other collectors. I assume that's what it was. I never did quite figure that out. But anyway, uh, Alan Lomax was the first one to be put in charge of that division. Well, he was impressed with Randolph's work. And also, Sidney Robertson was uh, an assistant to him. And, of course, Sidney had been here during WPA days helping him record, helping Vance record. That's the one that was with, out at David Rice's house. Uh, so they, uh, the one thing they liked was that he, here again, he considered the singer, his entire repertory as being important, not just the child's ballads, but everything they sang, like the skin and its contents again. And he also was the first one to include, include transcriptions with the song text, you know, of the music. So they offered to send him a recording machine you know, they wanted him to come get it, and then they were going to meet him halfway, but he always said, oh, my health is bad, I can't, and got out of that and everything. Well, finally, they offered him the recording machine that they would bring it here, and $1,000. Well, he wrote them back, and he said, well, I really will appreciate the $1,500, uh, but you'll have to bring it all that. Well, they, he got the money, and he never did account for where it went at all. And uh, Cochran and Shoemate uh, both said that he was the champion panhandler of all times. But anyway, it was worth the Library of Congress's. Here he was recording down at Reed Springs. That's Deacon Embry, H-E-M-B-R-E-E, -E, and that's his son playing there. I met his son's, that son's daughter here, who was about my age, uh, not too long ago. That's the equipment they sent him, and it had also uh, uh, car batteries that you had to take along with it, too, so it was quite a cumbersome thing. He had to have it loaded in the, that was one of his things for wanting more money, because he said he needed his car, you know, to, to go on. I just brought one volume. It's a four volume, and this is the reprint. I don't have the original, but that's the Ozark Folk Songs. That's the one volume of it. Um, by the end of January, which was the five months they allotted him to do this, he had sent them 150 discs of five, with 500 songs. And then in 1945, uh, after all the other collect he collected more of them, he sold his folk song manuscript to the State Historical Society of Missouri for publication. Now, they were they agreed to publish it because of the efforts of Henry Belden. Now, Henry Belden was uh, the president of the Missouri Folklore Society and a teacher at MU, 
and was also a folk song collector. And he published a, a book called Ballads of Songs Collected by the Missouri Folklore Society in 1940. But Bass was, uh, uh, of course, he dedicated all four volumes then to Henry Belden because he was appreciative of what he'd done. Now these volumes, the four, this plus the other three, uh, contain 882 titles, 828 tunes, and 1,644 texts. Now the reason there's so many texts is the variants of each ballad. They would have one ballad, and then they might give six or seven texts, different variants of that one text. You know. It's one of the largest ever in the United States of one region. Well, I think it surpasses Brown by, by a few, when, they, when you add the body material in, see. Now, uh, of course, this, this is a reprint in 1980 by the University of Missouri Press. But if you include the body songs, which was 463 texts and 187 tunes, that comes to 2,107 texts and 1,015 tunes. Now, by comparison, Belden only, only had, well, only, but had 605 texts. Loma Kansler, who was from Dallas County, he will never hear of these people, also a great folk song collector in, in Missouri, had nearly 1,800, and Max Hunter, who we're all familiar with here, had 1,595. So Vance is completely uh, outshowing all the others. Now I've got just a little snippet here, but just so you can say, well, I heard Vance Randolph sing. I've got him singing a little bit of Babes in the Woods. Are you familiar with Babes in the Woods? That's the, uh, one that's been traced back to 1601 uh, about a nobleman that uh, dispatched his niece and nephew uh, by just abandoning them into the woods. You know. But this is an old, old ballad, and my wife remembers uh, her grandmother singing this to her, let's see if I can do this up there. Now, I don't know if you can hear this or not. 